Well, good morning. I'm so glad you've joined with us for this time of worship through the study of God's Word. We're continuing today in our study of the book of Isaiah. And as we get ready to begin, I'll just remind you that our study, Christianity Explored, begins on Monday night, tomorrow night, February 21st at 7 o'clock here at the church. Uh, if you have questions about what it means to follow Jesus, just who is he and what am I supposed to do with this, this understanding of who he is and what he's done, uh, then we would love to have you join us. Uh, give us a call here at the church. Leave us your name and number so that we have a, a place set for you and we'll make room for you. We'd love to have you join with us. Well, let's open our time together in prayer this morning and then we'll look into God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your grace. We ask you today for your peace. We need peace in our hearts. We need peace in our homes. We need peace in our relationships. We need peace in our church family. We just need peace, period. Uh, we need peace in our community. We pray for peace in our country. We pray for wisdom in our own words and interactions with others. We pray for wisdom for those who are in leadership in this country. We ask that they would come to Christ and find salvation and forgiveness in him. We pray that, that we would be free here to share the gospel. And that as that continues, that we wouldn't be satisfied merely with being free to share the gospel, but that we would be active in sharing the gospel with people around us. Father, we are living in a place and at a time of great and deepening division and anger and confusion and chaos pain and loneliness, would you help us? Help us as your children. Help us as followers of Jesus. Help us as citizens of your kingdom who are simply living here. Would you help us to display the character of Christ? Help us to relay the truth of forgiveness and life and peace in and through Jesus alone. For those in our church family dealing with physical needs, uh, health issues. Father, we pray that you would encourage them today, that you would grant them uh, relief and recovery and, and uh, healing. And Father, we pray that you would strengthen them, remind them of your presence with them. Others who may be dealing with relational issues or financial stresses, whatever might be going on, would you meet the needs of their hearts? Would you use us in each other's lives as brothers and sisters in Christ to bring hope and strength and help and encouragement to one another this week? And as we gather here this morning around your word, we ask that you would speak to us clearly, help us to hear what you have for us, help us to take it to heart, and live in light of what you say to us today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There are a lot of things we do as acts of worship when we get together. Uh, we, we give. We give the first and the best part. Uh, to the Lord. We give from what he's provided us with, and it, it's a way to show him that we understand, God, this is, this is from you, this is still yours, and that you have first place in our lives. And so we express all of that in the act of, of giving as part of our worship. Uh, we get together and as an act of worship, we join our hearts together in prayer as we praise God for who he is and as we plead for him to help in our own situations and the situations of those around us. Uh, another act of worship is we join our voices as we sing uh, his praises together. Another act of worship is what we're doing right now. We listen to his word together with our ears and our hearts. We gather around his word to hear what he has to say to us. Another act of worship is, is serving one another and encouraging one another. And as we walk through these acts of worship in our lives, we need to ask ourselves, what, what lies underneath it all? What motivates these acts of worship? What drives them forward? Is it a heart of worship? Is it a heart at worship? Or are we merely working through a, a checklist? Are we living kind of on the surface? Uh, did our bodies come to worship or did our hearts come to worship? That's a, a real spiritual danger uh, for us in walking with God, is that it's just surface stuff instead of the heart engaged in worship. And this spiritual danger is nothing new. In fact, Isaiah dealt with this with the people of Judah back in Isaiah chapter 58, and that's where we're looking this morning. As you turn there, picture this. Picture the people of Judah gathering for worship, and they come in thinking, okay, we're going to bring our sacrifice, we're going to sing some songs, Isaiah's going to 
teach, speak, and, and then we're out of here. We, got, we get on with our day and we got things to do. So they rush in, they, they're running through their, their, their routine of worship, and, and then they hear these words from God through the prophet Isaiah, not so fast. Slow down a minute. Where are you going so in such a hurry? Sit down. There's more still to be said. I remember as a kid being told by my mother, go upstairs and clean your room. You cannot go out and play with your friends until your room is clean. Well, I did what you probably did. Run upstairs into my room. Look around. Pull the blanket up over the bed. Uh, look at stuff on the floor. Kick it under the bed. Uh, stuff stuff in the closet. Close the door. Look around. Perfect. Run down the stairs, and on my way through the kitchen, heading for the door, I hear the words, not so fast. Did you really clean your room? Yep, it's all spick and span, ready to go. I'm good. I can get out of here. Did you, did you rush through something with no heart in it just so you could get on with what you want to do? Or did you actually do what you were called to do? And then mom would go up and take a look, and maybe my room wasn't so clean, and I wasn't ready to run out and play just yet. Well, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about this morning. Not so fast. Isaiah 58 begins this way. Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness. It did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Now this, this is Isaiah, God speaking through Isaiah, and he, he's speaking to my people, the house of Jacob. He's not talking to the nations out there at this point. He's not speaking to Babylon. He's not speaking to anybody else. He's speaking to his people, the people of Judah. He's not speaking to unbelievers out there. He's speaking to his people who claim to be his, who are supposed to know better. This is who he's talking to. And our application to this passage this morning cannot be that we think that this nation is the nation he's talking about, or that another nation is the nation that he's talking about, or that the West in general is this nation that God is talking about. It's not. We need to see believers, followers of Jesus, as the people of God, the citizens of the kingdom need to act like the citizens of the kingdom no matter when they live or where they live. And so we need to keep that in our hearts and our minds as we go through this passage this morning. And God says, speak to my people, declare to my people, to the house of Jacob, their transgression, their sins. He's not talking about someone else's sins, the sins of the nation, the sins of their neighbors. This, he's talking about theirs. It's so easy, isn't it? To listen to and look at your sin instead of mine. It's so easy for us to listen to and look at their sin instead of ours. But this is what God's calling his people to do. He's saying, Isaiah, you, you declare their sin and their transgression, get their attention. And they're going, well, this doesn't make sense to us. And God says, well, I understand that doesn't make sense because, because on the one hand, you've got this problem, there's sin and transgression. Yet, that first word of verse 2 is really important. Yet, Despite this sin, this transgression that you've got, you carry on like everything's fine. You carry on in daily worship. You seek me daily as though there's no problem. As, as though you delight to know my ways and you want to draw near to me. And, and as if we've got no issue. But he says we've got this issue of sin and yet you carry on with worship like there's no problem. But the problem is when you add verse 1, the God's people living with sinful hearts, and you add that to verse 2, uh, God's people carrying on in worship like everything's fine. The problem is you end up with verse 3. And verse 3 says, Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Why is God not paying attention? Why don't we feel his presence? Why is God not, but not actively engaged in what's going on around us here? It, it doesn't make sense to us. Why is this seemingly gaining us nothing? And God says it's because verse 1 and 2 don't add up. You land in verse 3, you land with this confusion of nothing happening, where God does not see, God does not approve, God does not, uh, is not uh, excited about this or impressed with this in any way. Why? Well, let's take a look. The end of verse 3 says, Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. 
you, you take a day to fast. Ooh, this act of worship, you're fasting to praise God. But you make it about yourself. It's supposed to be about putting yourself to the side. It's supposed to be about denying yourself and focusing on God. Instead, they were denying themselves and forcing their workers to work harder. Well, I'm taking the day off to fast, but you crank out an extra, an extra day's worth of work here today so that I, I can still make money here. Or I'm, I'm doing this so that I look good. It was all about themselves. It was about their own pleasure. It was about, it was about words looking good instead of an actual life of worship. Look at their interactions. Behold, verse 4, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. God said, look at your interactions. You're supposed to be engaged in fasting and worship and in praising me and in walking with me, but your hearts aren't humble before me and therefore with each other. No, you're fighting, you're arguing, you're, you're hitting each other, you're, you're fighting with each other, you're making this all about you. And your interactions do not reflect a heart that's at peace with God. And so he says, fasting like this, I pay no attention to. That's not going to make your voice heard in heaven. Well, we did this, did this, and did this, so surely God's going to hear us. Not with that heart. Not with that heart. God says in verse 5, Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Really, this is a day for me? A day where you're just getting through the motions on the surface and underneath you got all this other stuff cooking? A day where you say, well, we'll press pause on living the way we want and we'll honor God for an hour today and then we'll get back to it? No, God says, that is not, that is not what I want from my people. He says, not so fast to their fast. Then he says, this is the fast. Take a look. Verse 6 says, Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? What does he say? Look at the contrast between verse 6 and 7, the fast that God calls them to, and verse 3 where they just take a day to seek God's face, but they're using it for their own pleasure and they're abusing each other in a process. This is very different. Instead of focusing on others and what they're doing, God says you need to focus on your own heart. Your own heart. You need to get back to using things and loving people instead of loving things and using people. He says, that's the fast what I, that I want. I want a day of worship that reflects a heart that flows out of a heart like this, that cares for other people, that walks in humility, that says, I will not abuse you. I will help you. I will not use you for my own gain. I will serve you to see how you can be, how your needs can be met. He says, if you do this, then, verse 8, you, shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you live that way, with a heart like this, you worship me from a heart that's engaged in loving others in humility like this. Not just for an hour or for a spiritual show, a religious show, but the genuine article from a heart that's changed and surrendered to me. If you live that way, then, then your light will shine. That's Matthew chapter 5. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Then God will, your, will shine your light. Then God will be with you. Then God will hear you. Psalm 66 verse 18 says, if, I'd, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, God would not have listened. We've got to come to him in humility and repentance Say, God, I just want to walk with you. Forgive me for sin. Lead me forward. Help me to walk with you. Help me to love people the way you want me to love them. And then we get on with serving one another. Instead of worrying about me and what's going on with me and how's everybody there to help me, Lord, how do you want to use me to help somebody else today? Then your light will shine. And having our light shine is not we all get our 15 minutes of fame or our moment in the spotlight. It's having the way we live 
shine a spotlight on Jesus Christ. It's having the way we live point others to him. That's the light that we want to shine. We don't shine the light on ourselves. We point it up and say, look at him. Don't worry about me. You look at him. He's the one that you need to worship. He's the one that can offer you the help and the hope that you need. I'm just someone here to point you to him. He continues in the same vein, the second half of verse 9. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, again, they're not saying, he's not saying worry about what everybody else is doing along this, this, these lines. You, what are you doing? If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness. If you do these things, if you, if you live this way, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday, and the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail, and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall rise up, the, raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Then you will be back in the back at home in my, in my country, in my place that I've got for you, that nation of Judah. Then I will bring you back, and I will work with you and through you, and my presence will be there. If you stop using each other, if you stop pointing the finger at each other and look at your own heart, if you stop speaking evil to each other and about each other, if instead you will pour yourself out for the hungry, pour yourself out for others, if you express a heart of love for me and a love for others, then you will know my presence. Then you will see my hand at work. It's been said that that just like a bomb has a blast radius, the, the, the area of impact if a bomb goes off, that, that a church should have a love radius. That everyone within a distance of that church should know that they are loved, cared for, and prayed for. And that there is a place of help and hope in their community. And take that a step further. If you're a follower of Christ, your home should have a love radius right there in your neighborhood. Do your neighbors know that they are cared, cared for, loved, prayed for, and that there is someone there with help and hope for them? At work, at school, in the desks around you, is there a love radius around you where people know that they're loved, cared for, prayed for, and that there's hope and help, and that you're there to point them to that source of hope and help? God says, if you live this way, then I will hear you. If you live this way and you, you love this way, then, then you will know my presence. Then you will see my hand at work and experience my blessing. Verse 13 says, If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. If you, you treat the Sabbath like it's about me and not about you, God says. If you treat the things that are about me like they're about me and not about you. If you walk in obedience, then you will live with the, the, the benefits of that, the blessings that come from that. You might be sitting there right now saying, oh, Steve, that is so Old Testament. Well, not really. What did Jesus say? The first and greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. This sounds like Isaiah 58. This is the way we're called to live. And friends, this is the call to God's people, not some other group. He's not saying make sure other people live like this and act like this. He's saying you, my people, live like this. It starts here with your hearts, he says. It starts here with our hearts as followers of Christ. And we're in this together. We are people for his name, but we are a people for his name. We are followers of Christ in this community, but we together are the body of Christ in this community. Do we want to know his presence? Do we want to experience his blessing, see his power at work, see his impact 
in this place, in this community, then we need not just to have, have our bodies at worship. We need to have our hearts at worship. We need to have hearts of worship, not merely external acts of worship. We need to walk with him as his people, not just today because it's Sunday, but every day, every day. God says, not so fast. With that fast you're doing, the way you're going about this is all wrong. Here's what I want. Here's what I, I am calling an act of worship. Well, that danger to get this confused and to get this wrong, to live on the external level instead of from the heart, that didn't just end in Isaiah's day. Take another look with me. Look at Luke chapter 18. My heart and my mind kept going back to this passage this week as I was studying in Isaiah chapter 58. Look at Luke 18 with me. In Luke 18, Jesus tells this story, parable. Look at verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The people hearing Jesus say this in first century Israel, they're probably thinking, "Uh uh-oh, this isn't going to end well. I mean, the Pharisee going up to the temple to pray, we get that. Robes, living by the rules, walking in righteousness, making sure people see him, and we want to be like him, and we want to be near him. He's the religious guy. He's 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 the guy, the holy guy that we want to be near. Look at him. Oh, we, 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 we got to be close to this guy. It makes sense for him to come to church. I mean, look at him. Then they look on the other hand, they go, this tax collector, are you kidding me? He's probably cheating us all. He's working for the occupying Roman government. Nobody likes him. We don't want him around us. We don't want him at the temple with us. And these two are about to clash and whoo-hoo. All right, Jesus, where does the story go from here? And Jesus is telling them this story, and he says, well, the Pharisee and the tax collector go up to pray. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed this way, probably with his church voice on. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, twice I give tithes of all that I get. God, I'm here at church today to thank you for me. Thank you for making me, me. I mean, look at me. Who wouldn't want to be me? I'm amazing. I, 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 I tithe. I walk by all the rules. I, 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 I fast. I mean, I do all of these religious activities. Look at me. Who wouldn't want to be me? Look, I, I'm amazing. And look at these other losers. I mean, there's people here that lie and cheat. They cheat on their taxes. They cheat on their on, on their spouses. Uh, we got tax collectors here. Look at this guy. He's ripping us off. He's working for the Romans. Thank you. Thank you that I'm not like this guy. In the meantime, the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He wouldn't even come close. He just stood at the back and said, God, God, look at me. I know who I am. I know the sin in my life. I know I need your mercy, and you're the only one that can give it. Please be merciful to me. I am such a sinner. I don't deserve to be in your presence, but I I need to be. I want to be. On the one hand, you have a guy who was most certain he would be welcome at the temple that day. In fact, he was figuring people would want to see him there. God would surely want to see him there. Others would want to see him there. They would want to be seen with him there. Uh, Like a celebrity who shows up at the Super Bowl, not to see the game, but to be seen at the game. That was how this guy approached going to the temple. On the other hand, you've got this tax collector who quietly slips into the back of the service. Not sure if he's welcome, not even sure if he's welcomed by God there. But he's drawn. He can't stay away. He's drawn. So he just humbly comes seeking God's mercy. And Jesus said, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other, the religious Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. 
As important as that story is that Jesus told and the lessons we learned from it, which tie right back into Isaiah 58 and into our day, as important as that story is, is understanding who Jesus told this story to and why. Look at verse 9 of Luke 18. He, Jesus, also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Wow. I wonder if when he started this story, they were thinking, yep, I'm right there with the Pharisee. I'm, I'm righteous like that. Oh, the tax collector, what a loser. I'm glad I'm not like him. Until Jesus got to the end. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. In our day, in our hearts, in our lives, in our interactions, may God guard us from both of those attitudes, trusting in our own righteousness and treating others with contempt. Instead, may we humbly walk, trust in his righteousness, and then walk in it. May we humbly look at each other with grace, understanding two things. Number one, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And number two, we all, that's right, we all need God's grace today and every day. And as we walk and live and worship and interact this way, may God receive glory as our light then shines through pointing others to him. He is, after all, the point of it all.